We welcome our viewers to the Point of View on the Point of View's YouTube channel. And we have a big show tonight. We're looking at kidney disease, treatment of all kinds, and in particular, making dialysis affordable. We have a big panel who will go into the details. We have a patient who's on dialysis. We have the CEO of Ghana's largest hospital. We have a globally celebrated nephrologist. And then we have the CEO of the Health Insurance Scheme, all joining to talk about how to make treatment for kidney diseases accessible and affordable. If you love this video, kindly share with your followers and also subscribe to The Point of View on YouTube. So the numbers don't make for good reading when it comes to dialysis issues and kidney treatments, but various studies have been done on the issue of chronic kidney disease kidney failures and all the issues that have to do with that particular organ. And tonight I'll be speaking to a big panel. I have first in studio Major Kojo and Ahinkra, who is um, a retired soldier. No, point of correction. It's my nickname. Oh, that your name is Major? Yes. It's not your real name? It's not my real name. Where did you get the name from? Oh, uh, from school, cadet. <laughs> it was Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major. And then it has turned out friends call me Major Major. So the military should not come after me. I see. It's just so, my nickname. I, I see. I, well, I've given you the position already. So <laughs> Thank you. he is a, a patient on dialysis treatment. He will share his story with us. Uh, Dr. Opoko Rampoma is joining us shortly. He is the CEO of Kolebu Teaching Hospital. A plastic surgeon by training, but he's running uh, Ghana's largest hospital. He's joining us in a few moments. We are also joined uh, from the United States of America by uh, Dr. Koshi Dumo, and he's an assistant professor of medicine in nephrology and critical care, University of Virginia, USA. And he has many, many credentials. In fact, he, I'm sure, will talk to us more about some of his work in Ghana as well, as far as kidney issues and nephrology is concerned. So. Uh, Dr. Dumo, thanks for joining us. Good evening. Thank you for having me, Bernard. Wonderful. We also have Dr. Bernard Okoboy, who is the CEO of the National Health Insurance Scheme, a medical doctor himself. There have been many, many calls for the NHIS to include dialysis treatment, tests and labs and all those things on the NHIS. We'll ask Dr. Okoboy what the current state of affairs is and whether this is possible. So, uh, Dr. Koboy, thank you for joining us. Good evening. Good evening, senior. Already here. <laughs> and I notice you are not in the House of Folk Jesse tonight. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, so, let me just start with uh, Mr. Hinkra. So, just tell me a bit about your story. How long have you been on dialysis treatment and how has it been like? Um, I've been on dialysis treatment for eight years. Eight years? Yeah. And how many times a day? Uh, or a week? Three, it's supposed to be three times. But because of financial concerns, I'm doing two. So you can, you can still survive on two? It depends on how you take care of yourself. I see. So eight years, so this will be 2015. 15. Yes. Uh, do you, can you re re remind us of how, when you were diagnosed of um, kidney failure and how the whole process got to dialysis? Okay. Um, it started by... You know, my head, I used to exercise a lot. I, mm. I was staying at the mountains. Mm. I exercise a lot. My head, sometimes I go to the office early in the morning, like I would just be feeling sleepy. Mm. I wouldn't understand. I don't know what was going on. It went on, went on. One day I went to work. I came back late in the night, around 12 minutes. I couldn't breathe. The breathing was not coming. Mm. But when I come outside from the room mm -hmm. and I get fresh air, it's a bit okay. When I go back to the room, mm. the thing starts again. So quickly, I rushed to the Tatakwashi Government Hospital that mm. night. Mm -hmm. So when I got there, they managed the situation for me. But I started vomiting blood, mm. too. So they managed the situation. So during the daytime, they asked me to go and do some labs. Mm -hmm. So one of the labs was showing that. But the doctor said he did not trust the lab report. So he asked me to come to Lancet, East Ligon. Mm -hmm. So it was there that I came to do that one. And it showed. So when I went back, he told me, this is the situation. So he referred me to Kolebu. Wow. And I said, okay. But when he said that, I never stepped foot to the hospital again. Why? I didn't believe that thing. Proud to that, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, dialysis machine, dialysis machine, dialysis machine. We didn't, like, before then, it was very scary. 
Mm -hmm. It was very scary. So we didn't, I, I just didn't want to bother myself about it. So how long did you, how long were you in denial? Uh, roughly, you... roughly about six, seven months. Six, seven months in yes, denial? Yes, yes. So trying herbs. Trying herbs? Yes, trying herbs to get it correctly. But it wasn't working? No, no way, no way it wasn't working. So... But did you understand what the diagnosis meant for the kind of treatment you needed? When no. The, you didn't no. know at the I time what it meant? Any. Even my first day on the dialysis machine, I was still asking, when would they go and put me in the machine? Mm. I was expecting maybe they are going to put me into something to lock me there for a day or two. So even my first day on it, mm. I didn't even know. Wow. So I was still asking questions. So the doctor just told me, ah, but that is what you started doing. Wow. I didn't have any idea about it at all. I, I see. But you are on hemodialysis, not there's some, something they call peritomal dialysis. No, I'm on hemodialysis. Hemodialysis. Yes. And do you know the cause of your kidney failure? Because they, I'm told there are about seven different causes. Yes. Later on, I got to know I was um, hypertensive. So I is, never knew. Which is the commonest. Yes. Right. Let me just read some facts for, for, for viewers, then I'll come in. So kidney failure is common in Ghana, and hemodialysis is the most common treatment modality for survival. It's been available in Ghana for 50 years. We're told that after a situation assessment of uh, hemodialysis centers in Ghana, Ghana has about 51 centers in 916 regions. Of this, only 40 centers are functioning. The larger majority being the Greater Accra region, uh, which has about uh, 26 of the centers. Seven are in Kumasi or Ashanti. And then a few other regions have some. Some regions have none at all. In terms of the causes of kidney failure, as you did mention, there's the, the main cause being the hypertension. But there are other causes as well, some of which we say are, we are told are unknown as well. All right, now let's talk about the treatment seven years as you've had it. How much do you, did, you start, did you pay when you started going and how have the cost escalated? That would be, I cannot really recollect when I started 2015, but yeah. it was around two something. 200 and something yes, per second. session? Yes, per session. How long does the session last? Four hours. Four hours? Yes. And you were initially doing how many per week? Three. Three per week? Yes. So you paid about 400 and something CDs every time? Yes. So it's about 1,200 CDs every week? Yes. As at that time. As at that time? Yes. What is the cost now? Uh, it's 380. That is what we had. 380. Yes, that is what we are. We yeah, are here. Session. We are here. Yes. Before, before the closure, we were paying 380. And what, were you doing this at a public or private facility? Me, Kolebu has been my home. Kolebu is the main place you go. I because see. They, for my eight years experience, even though I've gone to other private dialysis centers, the kind of service Kolebu provides, you won't get it anywhere. Wow. So you think Kolebu is the best? It's the best. For people with uh, kidney failure, some of them get kidney transplants, but yes. a large majority go for hemodialysis. Did you think about kidney transplant? Well, I've thought of it, but the cost involved. And even getting the donor to is a problem. So it's both the donor and the cost? And the cost. Do you know how much it costs? The last time Kolibu did, that was recently, I've forgotten. But you, I've forgotten. it's beyond your ballpark? It's way, 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 way beyond. beyond. Way beyond. How do you finance your, 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 your HD? Uh, well, when I went to Kolibu 2015, uh, a man came in, first guy. So they have been supporting us all this while. As in, do they subsidize or they pay fully? They pay. He was paying it. So first guy will pay for your treatment? He was paying it. Wow. That, yes, he was paying it. For all the Kolebu dialysis patients? Yes, the, um, the OPD. The do you know how patient. many you are? Per... We are normally about 200. About 200? Yes. And he, he was paying for all of this? Yes. Until when? 22nd May. When the consumable got shot, when the unit was closed down to outpatient. This thing, people get it wrong. It was the outpatient. L let me say, we are a bit fortunate we can able to walk. If I meet you, I don't tell you I have a kidney. You wouldn't even know that is the situation. But when it was close to us, that was when we have to go and finance it ourselves. So those who were inpatients were still being looked after? Yes. It's those of you who are a bit fit, who go and come? Yes. Who had the closure? Yes. 
So when you were told that there was an increase from 380 to 7 something, what was your reaction to that? Oh, my brother. Even the 380, somebody was the one sponsoring us. So how much more going to that place? There was no way. It was a death sentence? Yes. What work were you doing before you were diagnosed? I was with one uh, microfinance, and when this banking sector cleared up, it affected me. So since from that time up to now, You've not been working. I've not been working. Wow. But if you had been working, could you have afforded it? Still, I can't. It would still be too much. Yes. Because you're spending, if you were doing three times a week, that's about 400 per session. So that's 1,200 yes. every week. Yes. So if you multiply that by 40, it's almost 5,000 CDs yes. a month. I mean, you see, that is just the, the cost of the dialysis. Your medications have not come. The injection that we take to bring, like, hold on to our blood has not come. The other petty, petty So explain this condition to me. Dialysis is required because your kidney is not functioning properly. Sure. So it means to excrete urine, you need help. Yes. But you also need certain medications to do what? For instance, like the, your blood, the HV. Uh, Okay, dog is here. I know every dialysis patient is anemic because when you go on the machine, the process you go through, when you finish, the amount of blood that came out, you will not get all. At least 1% to get stuck into the tubes and then the dialyzer. So mostly your HB goes, and once your HB goes, it's very dangerous. So there's an injection, you always, maybe a week or two, you have to take to keep you, let the blood be at the level that you might need it. And that, that one, Roughly, it's about one, two, two million. You need wow. to buy that one, yes. Wow. But if you really want to be constant, maybe then every week you need to take one. Every week you need to take one. Wow. Some of us that we are on BP medication, my BP medication is two. Um, Metodopa and Amnodopin. And these are not cheap? They are not cheap. As at now, even Metodopa, just one strip, is 17 cities. For one. And how many yes. do you need in a, in a week? Uh, I take three times, morning, afternoon, evening. A day? Yes, a day. So Multiply it, that by seven. And it's 17 CDs? Yes, per strip. And then we haven't come to the injection? We've not come to the injection. And then transporting yourself there and coming back? Thank you. So how do you survive? You know, few friends. And, you know, uh, I wouldn't like to mention them. Say, uh, I have a, so there are benefactors who support you? Yes. But the point is, it can get to a point in time. Uh, when they even see your call, they will not even pick it. They are also tired. Yes, it's becoming too many. Sometimes maybe you are even calling the person to say, well, hello. But they think you're asking them you're for asking money. You're asking for money. And I understand them. Wow. I understand them. Because... So this issue this week has been very troubling for you and your colleagues. Very. All right. I'll come back to you, but thank you for sharing. I really respect the clarity with which you spoke, and I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, let me welcome Dr. Puku Ayampuma, the CEO of Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Plastic surgeon by training, but running a hospital like Kolebu means you have to do everything. Mm -hmm. This has been a very tumultuous week for you. Or, in fact, the first two weeks, right? Um, just summarize for me your views on how we got here. Because at least in the news, it was announced that Kolebu had unilaterally increased the, the charge for HD. And then we're told that they didn't get approval. There was a pushback. There have been a lot of back and forth. So the horse is rear. So what really is the situation with Kolebu and the Alice's treatment? Okay, thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening to your viewers. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy to see our friend here who has um, at least, uh, spoken so well and so clearly. And um, this issue is an emotive issue, mm. but I believe that uh, for us to make progress, we have to discuss it dispassionately. And, um, of course, the plight of dialysis patients or kidney failure patients is something that's almost foremost on our minds. And mm. we are quite sensitive to, uh, you know, the situation. But um, how do they get here? Mm. So it so happens that, uh, like you said, for Kolebu Teaching Hospital, in the, in the whole country, mm. uh, the last time that the, the registry was done, we realized that there were about 700 patients who need renal uh, you know, dialysis consistently around mm. the country. Mm. Now, having said that, let me give you a bit of background. Mm. About 17% of the population have got kidney problems. Okay. Which is quite a large number. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and the average around the African continent is about 15%. But in Ghana, it's about around 17%. Okay. And so we have a, about, there's around 5 million of our population who have some form of kidney challenge. Mm. But then out of that number, Okay, if it is caught early, 
then mm. most of them can be able to survive on lifestyle modification, you know. And so early diagnosis is very important. Early diagnosis is very important. That's why, in fact, that's why screening is very important mm. because the God made the kidneys, God created the kidneys with redundant capacity. That's why it's possible for somebody to donate a kidney and that person can still remain survive. healthy. So a person can survive on one kidney? Exactly. In fact, you can actually survive on a quarter, I mean, on half of a kidney. Wow. If you're a healthy person, half of one kidney is enough to take care of your, your, your needs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, by the time that people start actually showing symptoms of kidney disease, mm -hmm. or like that's been the overt symptoms, mm -hmm. then you would then find out that most of the kidney capacity is actually gone. That is why screening is very, very important because the screening will help you to pick them up at a time that they are not symptomatic. Mm -hmm. you, know, and so, you know, so if you do the usual checks, you see that maybe some levels of certain elements in the blood are, are, are abnormal. And mm -hmm. so that will help to diagnose or there are certain other things that mm -hmm. are, are done. So that is it. So um, that small uh, proportion, mm -hmm. uh, that will then progress to end stage uh, renal disease. They are the ones who require dialysis to stay alive, or kidney transplants, or, or a kidney transplant. If they transplant. have a donor and if they can afford it, exactly, they can afford it. So, yeah, so that option is also there, okay, and um, and so uh, and dialysis generally, averagely, would help you to survive maybe between five to ten years. So, in fact, in Kolebu, uh, because of the support that we are getting, we are seeing patients who are surviving for much longer. Periods. He's been on for eight years. Exactly. It's looking pretty good. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so that really is helping. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, the sustainability is the question that has brought us here. Of course, if you get a living um, uh, related donor, that's the best. Mm -hmm. You know, that gives you about uh, you know about fifteen years plus of uh, you know extra mm -hmm. uh, life guaranteed. And then, of course, if you have a cadaveric donor, where you know in countries where they have a transplant law where kidneys can be harvested, mm -hmm. you know, and that uh, you know um, uh, option is there. It also gives you a, a certain lease of life. But then, uh, in this current situation, what did happen was that we have been uh, the prices were set a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So that three eighty, in fact, if you ask around, that was the cheapest uh, you can get around. Mm -hmm. But then. Um, because As in compared the, to other private facilities. To other facilities, yes. So you can see that um, because this was set some time ago, with exchange rate inf uh, fluctuations and inflation, this has eroded mm. the value of that. And so we're under recovery mm. in terms of uh, you know, uh, how much it costs for us to provide the service. So there was a need for us to adjust the price to, uh, so that we can be able to break even. So this is a service that we render, not for profit, but just to be able to break even and to be able to sustain it. And so um, there was a proposal from the department, mm. uh, which uh, because we took recent stock of consumables, uh, the, 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 the new price that we be given. So the unit cost of the consumable kit, which is used to provide the dialysis, mm. is 34 euros. That's mm. how much we're getting it from the supplier. So that is just a kit cost. And then there are other medications, drips, you know, mm -hmm. so that go into providing the service and running on the machines and so on. And so and there was a need to adjust this because the kit cost alone is around a ballpark figure of around 500 Ghana cities, which is more than the current cost that, uh, you know, uh, we're mm. providing the service. And so the usual channel, the usual route is that um, the unit would make its, uh, you know, calculations mm -hmm. and then make a proposal mm -hmm. which will go to the head of department then mm. uh, you also scale it up to the director of medical affairs and then to the CEO who then sits with the finance team and then look whether the figures make sense mm -hmm. and then we would uh, push it on to parliament through the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance. So that's the usual route. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately this time the, uh, you know, at the departmental level they prematurely uh, you know, put up the, the figures that they, you know. For so it didn't come to the CU? No, it didn't come. It didn't come. So you were surprised to hear that. Exactly. So, so, so came as a surprise. I mean, we knew that a proposal like that was coming because we, we, it has been discovered. We didn't even it know. That didn't been approved. That been approved. We didn't, we didn't even have the actual, uh, uh, you know, because we need to look at the current cost. So the, the actual figure was we didn't, we, didn't, we had not uh, reached us yet. The actual proposal had not reached us yet. And so as soon as this became evident. We, and uh, that's the director of medical affairs, issued um, a, a letter, a memo to the department to stop 
the you know uh, the increment and maintain the old price until we had gone through the mm. uh, you know the approval process and, and completed it. So where are we now? Has that been frozen? Yeah, so that was frozen. So the seven hundred and yes. is it seven twenty or something has been frozen. Seven fifty yes, was was frozen. That's so we are still on three eighty. Yeah, so we are still on three eighty. But will the seven sixty be approved? Yeah, so that is what we, we, we so we hope that you will send the seven sixty we'll to, to parliament. Parliament and the parliament because usually uh, and, and must, it must be noted that we don't just send uh, we provide a whole range of services. So where there needs to be any adjustment, we provide the uh, uh, you know our proposal to parliament and parliament mm. in this wisdom will discuss it and then give they us can either say yes or no or, say yes or, or, no, or, or exactly so or but the hospital it. as we speak thinks that 760 makes sense yes yes even though yeah. it may be a death sentence for him because he yeah, says no. even the 380 he can't afford it yes unfortunately that is the the challenge that we have and that's why sometimes we also try to absorb certain costs for them but this is looking at the actual input cost so sometimes we do not pass on all the costs to the mm. patient because some Times that we are able to also cross subsidize, but then uh, we are in a peculiar problem. In, we have a peculiar challenge in Kolibu because of the about 700 patients that are known to be on chronic dialysis in the country. About 300 of them are being treated in Kolibu, so wow. Kolibu is carrying the I mean, much of the burden. Mm. So for each one that we are under recovering, it means that uh, you know we do the figures. We run about if you are running the full service. We do about uh, 2,000 sessions every month. And so looking at the and our recovery rate means that we would have a deficit of a little over around 960. Why, why does Kolebu and why does Accra have the largest proportion of public dialysis facilities? Why is the distribution? In fact, in the search, only six regions or so have the centers. Yes, why? Yes. yes, so it's a combination of things. Because you need, you need, the, you need the experts, you need the equipment. So Kolebu has the largest collection of medical expertise. So definitely most people will gravitate towards Kolebu because it's the biggest facility that has the expertise. Mm. And so as we are able to, as we are in a drive to train more uh, nephrologists and more people, who are, because apart from even the doctors, you also need uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the nurses who are the renal nurses who also support the service. You also need uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the engineers who service the machines and so on. So there's a whole chain okay. of people who... I, I get know, it. And so mm -hmm. that... Uh, but we're hoping that this will be... Uh, we'll be able to roll out across the country uh, so that everybody in every region will be able to have a facility that is near the person. So I'm sure the question arises as to what happens to those people within, uh, within those uh, uh, you know, regions. But um, at the moment, this is what right. we have. Let me talk to Dr. Koshi Dumont. Yeah. This is the point of view we're trying to understand the dialysis situation, kidney, mm. uh, chronic kidney disease, kidney failure. And my guest in studio, Kojo Ahinkra, who is a, a, a dialysis patient. He survived for eight years, looking great. He says he can't afford the 760, even the 380, it was grace. Uh, Dr. Ampoma is the CEO of Kolibu, the largest treatment center public. And he says that the 380 was not approved, but the 760 will be approved or they, they will send that proposal if the parliament agrees, that's what it is. Now, Dr. Koshi Dumont is a triple board certified internist, nephrologist, and critical care physician. So he's somebody you need to talk to. An assistant professor and current lead for clinical faculty physician on the intensive care nephrology service at the University of Virginia. He trained at Legon, University of Medical School, University of Ghana Medical School, uh, worked at the Volta Regional Hospital in Hope, and did some work in different places, Columbia, New York, and other places, Harvard, and things like this. And for the purpose of this show, he's also an expert in acute kidney injury and renal replacement therapy, and an advocate for wellness, access, and equity in kidney health. Uh, Doc, thanks for joining us from, from Virginia. Have you been following the, you. the Ghana situation and the latest controversy from your busy schedules in Virginia? I, I have been following. I have been following very closely. And what do you make of all the controversy? Well, you, you know, unfortunately, um, dialysis does cost a lot. Um, there, there's a lot of upfront costs for our patients who go through dialysis. And so it's essential for us to make this something that they can access. And there are different ways in which we can, we can do that. Uh, Major spoke very eloquently uh, about his condition and how he's survived up until this point. Um, my, my senior from medical school, Dr. 
Pampoma has also said a few things, but I, I think it's important to do exactly what we're doing here, which is to start off by educating the public on kidney disease, because it's when people have an awareness of this that we're able to move policy forward and get people interested in making sure that we're able to provide care for our kidney patients. Uh, I would like if you would give me just a moment to just explain a few things which um, those who do not spend most of their time in the world of kidney disease might be wondering um, if, if you would give me that permission. Go ahead. Um, so the, the kidneys are two very small organs. Um, your entire body weight, the kidneys weigh just about 1% of your body weight. But at rest, when your heart is beating, 25% of your blood goes straight to the kidneys. This tells you just how important the kidneys are. And everybody kind of has an understanding that the kidneys are important for cleaning waste out of the body. But once again, Major pointed out a number of the other things that the kidneys do. So the kidneys are involved in blood pressure, involved in producing hormones to tell your bones to produce red blood cells. So that's another reason why our kidney patients who are on dialysis often end up with low blood counts and anemic, not just the blood loss within the, the treatment, but the fact that they're not actually making blood cells. In addition, the kidneys are responsible for getting rid of waste and fluid. Dialysis is a poor substitute for all the things that the kidney can do. Essentially, dialysis is a lifeboat to try and get us to something else. And usually that something else would be a kidney transplant. Major was pointing out how expensive it is to obtain a kidney transplant, and that's the same everywhere in the world. Unfortunately, though, if you look at it, a kidney transplant is actually cheaper than dialysis. Mm. The reason why we don't look at it this way is that the kidney transplant, all the fees are paid up front. You have to come up with mm -hmm. this entire huge sum of money up front in order to obtain a kidney transplant. Whilst, again, Major was describing how much he's paid, if you were to add all of that up over the eight years that he's been on treatment, I'm pretty sure it would have come up to enough to pay for a kidney transplant. So recognizing that people like Major are important members of society, that they contribute, these are our fathers, these are our mothers, these are our sisters, our brothers, our children. They are important members of society and they contribute, recognizing that we should in return be working to make sure that they get the treatments that they need. And there are many ways in which we can, can do that. And ho hopefully if we get the chance, we can talk about some of the strategies that other places use to try and make dialysis more readily available to a much wider populace. Thank you for that introduction. One of the things Dr. Ampoma said was that our kidney failure prevalence rate was higher than the African average. And I'm also told by some people in the sector that there are some African countries that have managed to make dialysis cheaper than we have Correct. in Ghana. What are some thoughts you can share around how Ghana compares with the best and worst? Where does Ghana place in terms of access for people from the public sector and in terms of prevalence and all that? Just give us some education on that. Sure. So you are completely right in understanding that every country has to form a system that works best for that country. We, we, we cannot just import what happens in America to Ghana or what happens in India to Ghana. We have to look at our situation and decide what will work best for mm. us. I'll give you an example. In the United States, kidney failure or people with what we call end-stage renal disease, those who are actually on dialysis, is one of only two conditions, that and HIV AIDS, which the government pays for completely. Wow. So if you are on dialysis in the United States, once you go on dialysis, those fees are completely paid for by the government. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is. It doesn't matter where you're from. That is paid for by the government. I will point out that at the time that they passed this law, there were only about 1,000 people on dialysis. That number has ballooned to over 200,000. So you can see that the price has, the price to the United States government has significantly increased. Every year they spend almost $37 billion on dialysis itself. 
But there are other ways of making the Sorry, can we can we ship excessive. can we ship major there to 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 get the treatment? Uh, because when you said it was free, he was smiling. Can we put him on a plane? <laughs> so so I, I would love to get major on a plane, but but more importantly, I would love to make this available to everybody, not just major, but all the other patients who are also going to to Kolebu and to the other parts of the country and. Uh, again, that's that's what we should be thinking about. How do we make it so that Major can go about living his life and not thinking of himself in terms of, I'm a kidney patient. He should think of himself as, I am Major, but I also happen to have kidney disease rather than, I'm a kidney patient who is called Major. So um, much as we, we would love to see some of those solutions that are available outside of our country, we, we have to be realistic. and. Um, I, I take my hat off to my, my, my senior, Dr. Ampoma, for the role he plays at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital because these are difficult decisions that have to be made. Look at him sitting right next to Major and still having to take... Uh, we just lost your sound, uh, Doc. We just lost your sound. Okay. okay, go ahead. I think we can hear you now. Okay. Okay. So, so I was saying that how do we take limited resources and stretch those resources so that they're available to the much wider populace? So, so let's let's talk about this this whole issue of dialysis. The first thing is what is dialysis? Um, I, I don't know if you you did science in secondary school, but for for those who did, they probably remember something called or, or remember hearing something called Graham's law of diffusion, which. Well, when I was in, in high school, I, I couldn't understand what the purpose of, of learning this was. But basically, it's just a simple process of taking a semi-permeable membrane. Think of when you would make tea in the morning. When you take that tea and put it in the water, after some time, the concentration of the water changes. And some of the material, which was at one point inside the tea bag, seeps out into the, the water but the T particles remain within the bag. In honesty, this is what dialysis is. We are taking blood out of the body, putting it through a filter, and using a solution to clean the blood and then return the blood to the patient. At its simplest form, this is what dialysis is, or this is what hemodialysis is. There is another form of dialysis, which I think you mentioned towards the beginning of the program, called peritoneal dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis involves putting a tube, or what we call a catheter, into the abdomen. Now, the lining of the abdomen, anybody who's ever seen the intestines of um, something that's being prepared sees how smooth that lining is. That lining actually can absorb fluid and it can also serve as a means of getting waste out of the body. So you can actually put fluid into the abdomen, allow it to sit. It basically cleans the blood, and then you drain that fluid out. So this is what we call peritoneal dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis is currently not practiced in Ghana. And peritoneal dialysis is cheaper than hemodialysis. So this is one of the things which the International Society of Nephrology has suggested that pursuing peritoneal dialysis as a means of treatment will lower the overall cost for our patient populace. Now, hemodialysis from a technical perspective is slightly easier to perform than peritoneal dialysis. But I can tell you all of my patients who are on peritoneal dialysis prefer to hemodialysis because with peritoneal dialysis, you don't go to the clinic to get treatments. You do the treatments at home by yourself. And much as kidney doctors like to think of ourselves as nice people, our patients don't want to spend several days a week coming to visit us. I'm sure Major will, will bear, bear. What is the, what is the barrier? The Doc, what, why don't we have peritoneal dialysis in Ghana? Do you know? Expertise. I would say expertise is the, the, biggest, the biggest issue. And, and a desire to make it happen. If, if we as a country feel that this is important enough for us to do, we can make it happen. And you are sure it's cheaper than hemodialysis? I am 100% sure it's cheaper than hemodialysis. Not only that, it's practiced in Kenya, 
It's practiced in South Africa. These these are countries which are somewhat similar in setting to to us. So if it's working in Kenya, why why is it not possible for it to work here as well? You've said a lot that we need to think about. I will take a short break, bring in Dr. Okoboy on the NHIS side, but there's still a few things we need to clarify going forward. For example, a, fr a friend of mine who's a, a pharmacist says he has experience to share from Kenya that dialysis is free to Kenyan citizens, and he suggests that dialysis, congenital cardiac surgery, which includes kids with hole in heart and heart attack cases, should be free. And he calculates that it should not cost government more than $5 million a year. I don't know how you do the calculations, but I will deal with some of those points as well. So this is the point of view. We're trying to get to the bottom of the kidney failure situation in Ghana with a huge panel and hopefully a bit more time than regularly. Stay with us. I just took a shower above the clouds. You know why? Because this is the Emirates A380. How do I cope with this heat? By staying five degrees cooler. Body odor is caused by germs, and on hot days, the sweating and the odor are more. That's why you need to get the new improved Dettol Cool Soap, which offers up to five degrees instant cooling sensation. This advert is FDA approved. <laughs> Intestinal worms may cause itching, abdominal pains, loss of appetite, and anemia. <laughs> Intestinal worms may enter the body through improperly cooked foods, dust, or contaminated soils. Wormplex 400 is an effective dewormer for both adults and children and can be taken at any time of the day. It is recommended to deworm periodically. One tablet of Wormplex 400 kills intestinal worms, roundworms, hookworms, tapeworms, and other intestinal worms. I recommend Wormplex 400 to you because it has worked for my family. Lactating mothers, pregnant women, and children under two years should consult Wormplex their physician before taking Wormplex 400. Wormplex 400. Wormplex 400. Wormplex 400. Yeah, yeah. Wormplex 400. As soon as time for this advert is FDA approved. Welcome back tonight. We're talking about kidney failure and the possible treatment. We've been educated to know that the best form is essentially prevention, early detection, which Major, who's my guest in studio, Kojo Ahinkra, has said. Dr. Uh, Ampoma has agreed. We've been getting a mini lecture from Dr. Koshi Dumo. I was really enjoying his lecture. I hope I'll go back to him. Very exciting insights. But I want to bring in another duty bearer in Ghana, uh, Dr. Bernardo Koboy is the CEO of the National Insurance Scheme. This week, I've heard two prominent people say we need to make dialysis treatment free and we need to add it to the list of things covered by the NHIS. I've heard the United, well, WHO rep in Ghana say this and I've heard the information minister advocate for this. So Dr. Okoboy, thanks for your patience. Thanks for joining the program. Um, I've, I'm sure you've heard people suggest that we must add dialysis treatment to the NHIS. So is that, is that going to happen? <laughs> is that your call? Or just, just talk to me about <laughs> what you've heard people say yeah. and whether sitting, managing the scheme with all these problems now, you're able to say, yes, 100%, we can do it. I mean, first of all, let me say a very good evening to all your panelists. Um, to uh, to uh, order the Ampoma and to yourself. Um, yeah, Richard, so, uh, sorry, Ben. Um, what I'll say is that when the National Health Insurance Scheme was birthed some 20 years ago, there is good reason why the, the architects didn't put every disease in the world on the scheme. So we realized that the disease burden that is covered by the National Health Insurance is about 95% of all diseases in Ghana. They strategically left out those diseases that 
by threatening the sustainability of the fund. Like complex heart surgeries, like terminal diseases that you have to be committed to for forever in court, uh, which include um, um, cancers, renal diseases, and, and other conditions, uh, there's some neural conditions and all that. The theme of the National Health Insurance Scheme is your access to health care. And so, despite the fact that we have a defined range of diseases to attend to or to pay for, we also are always engaged constantly in ways to uh, grant access to every Ghanaian irrespective of the kind of disease that they are experiencing. Now, as I speak to you, we have, um, um, how do you call it? We have actuarial studies being done for mental conditions, mental disorders, like schizophrenia, depression, mania, and all that. Why? Because those in that field, the physicians in that field, the advocates have come to us that you have to find a way to put that also on the scheme. As we speak, some advocates for prostate care have approached the scheme. In fact, we've done stakeholder studies. We are now doing the costing and everything. There's advocacy for prostate cancer to be put on a scheme. Dialysis conversation started before these issues came up. So Bernard, what I want to say is that ultimately, it is our duty as a country and as a state to make sure that everybody is taken care of. I've always insisted that it is unethical to pay for malaria and let go of heart disease. And so um, the truth is that even the, the actuarial studies for mental health show that once we start to show that mental health in addition to all that we have, and we keep our current inflow, stream inflow constant, the scheme might be threatened. Now, the way to to go if we want to add on more benefits is to um, look at our inflows. Ghana has a scheme that has 90 to 94% of its inflows, as in the fund that come in, coming from central government through levies. These levies, when they are collected, must first, by law, go to the exchequer, go to the Ministry of Finance. And historically, from President Kufo's time to now, no CEO at health insurance has succeeded in getting a full complement of what is of what is collected. Because the funds come through taxes. So in somewhere 2004, when health insurance kicked off, about 10% of our inflow is monies we collect directly, what we refer to as IGF. This came from premium that those who are not on the SNIT, that's informal workers pay, as well as processing fees. That's all we, 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 we take, the fees we take for you registering to be on insurance. Bernard, I hope you are there. I'm following you. Over these 13 to 40 years, now we are in the 20th year, most of the fees, both premium and processing, have remained constant. They've not moved. They've moved only once. Currently, a SNIT contributor like myself pays about eight Ghana cities maximum for the whole year for care. What I pay is actually processing fee. I don't even pay any premium. And for those who are informal contributors, the so-called premium they pay is about 27 Ghana cities. When you take away the processing fee of our service cities, they pay 20 Ghana cities for premium for 12 months. So the fees have, are unrealistic. And because we have paid the same fees for 13, 14 years, it used to contribute 8 to 10% of our IGF. Now, IGF is about 4%. Mm. So close to 95% of what we expect that comes to health insurance for the, the, our work, paying uh, bills, is from the taxes, which is central government through the mutual finance, and just about some 4% from SNIT contribution. Bernard, people have mentioned Kenya. I had the privilege of visiting Kenya, talking to their CEO, and studying their scheme. In Kenya, about 90% of the funds they use comes directly into the fund of their national of their health insurance scheme, not through taxes routing through an exchequer. The reason is that in Kenya, about four to five percent of salaries are deducted from source into the fund. Straight. And so straight into the fund. 
And so the CEO told me that, look, even the deductions of the former workers alone is able to shoulder the, the unpredictable income or okay. inflows from the informal sector. Fair enough. L let's look at it this way. You said that mental health people are doing some studies on what yeah. it will take. We are doing the studies. Yes, fine. Based on the attention kidney failure has caused and the fact that everybody's talking about it now, do you think the NHIS is in a position to calculate what it will cost the scheme to put every person on dialysis on the scheme yeah. as a starting point? Then the second All question right. would be, when you do that, can you then come up with how do we pay for it? Because we have to start with yeah. what we want to achieve before how we achieve it, right? So is this something that NHIS is willing to do based on the number of patients with renal failure? Can you initiate some calculations into what it will cost the scheme and then we can then discuss how to pay for it? Bernard, I think our key objective in this discussion, in all this conversation, is to remove the out-of-pocket situation. Mm. And you can remove it through paying for the care from national health insurance or other means. And let me state quickly that when the board, National Insurance, our board met the last time, a five-member committee was set up, or has been set up, to come, to come and tell us whether the actual studies will sustain funding for renal disease or not. But not to end there, but to come with recommendations on how to take away this out-of-pocket scenario, which brings serious burden and takes away access. Bernard, we can... As a country, I can tell you boldly, if we are committed to, we can pay totally for kidney care. Wow. There are three things we can do. First of all, politically, we've been going back and forth on funding to national health insurance. I just told you about Kenya. Kenya even pays for kidney transplant. The reason is very simple. Simple. 90 to 95% of their funds is directly with them. Mm. They don't go to politicians in court or parliament to ask for money. Number two, we can put some levy, what we, they, is referred to elsewhere as thin syntax, on some one or two products which are normally not consumed by the ordinary person, but by people in a particular class. And the inflows from that fund can go, can from that levy, can go into a fund, not necessarily with national health insurance. It can be the chronic disease fund or the peripheral disease fund, which would go to the departments that take care of kidney care and other conditions like cardio diseases. It will enable Dr. Poma to heavily subsidize the care so that instead of the 700 that is being looked at, you can be paying 200 because 500 has been paid for from this fund. Thirdly, we as a country can come together quickly to take away either all the taxes on any item that goes into kidney care mm. or mm. we can look at two or three consumables which can which affect the pricing, like Dr. Poma mentioned, and the state can procure it directly from central uh, wow. government. These are ways you see because if you get a consumable bought by bought for by government, it cannot be used elsewhere. You can't buy it from the supermarket, you can't buy it from pharmacy. If to be really not for sale, and and facilities that have been certified, whether private or public, can have access to it and it will immediately reduce the cost straight down by 70 or 80 percent wow. so we have a duty as a country to find ways to beat down the cost either to zero or to about 20 percent and the lastly lastly if you put in all these measures you can still register those who are indigent who even with all the interventions cannot afford some 20 ghana cities at the center to take care of some cleaning and all that give them special cards and the state can reimburse from health insurance for that 50 cities. It can be done. Wow. It is just that you, you've, given us, you've given us four very powerful ideas. I, I will take a break, think about them. I noticed my panelists in-house were nodding vigorously. They seem to agree. I'll take their comments on it. I'll go back to Dr. Dumont as well to get his views on what else can be done because he feels, apart from hemodialysis, the other one, peritonal, can be increased. So there's, we, we have a bit more time. So please stay on the line. This is the point of view tonight. We're placing the microscope on your kidney. Hopefully, we'll come up with some solutions. Stay with us.
Emirates Premium Economy. One day, all airlines will have seats like this. Fly Emirates, fly better. Finally, anyone can become a household. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you go flip a real estate gaming platform that allows you to play and stand a chance of winning a house or cash or consolidated yeah! plans, such as savings towards a house. Simple and easy to play. Visit www.yougoflip.com Buy a ticket to enter the game. Wait for the end of the game to enjoy the win. Anyone can win. Flip it or own it. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Play responsible, not for persons below 18 years, and gaming can be addictive. Just close the doors, and you're in a world of your own. Travel is not just about the destination, it's also about how you get there. Fly Emirates, fly better. Welcome back. We're still on the point of view. We've been giving a bit more time to go deeper into making kidney treatment accessible and affordable in Ghana. We will talk about prevention. We'll talk about early detection. But now that the dialysis topic has come up, we're dealing with it with some suggestions. My guest in studio, I call him Major Kojo Ahinkra. He's been on dialysis for eight years, an advocate who's really speaking well from the condition. Thank you so much for talking. Uh, Dr. Uh, Opoku Wariampomasi of Kolebu Teaching Hospital, who have been in the news very interestingly this week. I also have Dr. Koshi Dumo, who's been, uh, he teaches in Virginia. He's a nephrologist, a professor of medicine in nephrology and critical care. He's actually one of the big guys who deal with kidney transplants. And he's proposing we should also increase peritoneal dialysis, which works with the intestines. Dr. Bernardo Kobo is the CEO of NHI. He's given us some very interesting suggestions. You were nodding vigorously. You, you, you appear to agree with him that we can actually pay for chronic kidney disease for everybody if we do the right things. You agree with him? Yes, I think so. Wow. All right, so uh, uh, just to make a few points. I, I want to make a few comments about the input that uh, Dr. Koshi... First, made. okay, yes, let's do with Koshi's so, input. Yes, yeah. uh, so, Koshi, thank you for your very uh, vivid explanation, I think, which broke down the subject very well for our, our listeners or viewers because... Uh, not many people really understand uh, many things about kidney diseases. And yeah. So I think that was uh, very lucid. Um, um, with regards to, I think you mentioned something about peritoneal dialysis. Yeah. Um, we, there's some, in fact, the, the expertise is available here to do peritoneal dialysis. And in fact, in, at some point in time, the children's block, children were doing peritoneal dialysis for the, the kids with the children with the renal failure. Unfortunately, uh, because for us in Ghana, Mm -hmm. A lot of the consumables are imported. Mm. And one of the disadvantages of peritoneal dialysis is that you have to do it almost daily. Mm. Okay, so it ends up becoming actually more expensive uh, for us. But with some of the suggestions that Dr. Bernardo Koboy made, you know, if, let's say, this becomes an issue that we are tackling as a nation and we decide that, look, we are going to procure these consumables at source and, you know, uh, get it in without, uh, you know, then it's possible for the price to come down. Mm -hmm. But I just want to make the point that there is expertise available, but it's because for us in a mm -hmm. particular situation, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. didn't give much of a, 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 in terms of the cost. So that is why it is not being mm -hmm. uh, uh, pursued here. And then um, I think he made a point rightly that some countries are, uh, you know, subsidizing this. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, in places like Kenya, Botswana, you know, you get two sessions free every week. Two and, sessions free every, every week. week? Yes. You know, wow. so, 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 so that, that, that has been done in some places. But then um, I think when Dr. Koboy also rightly uh, made a point that, um, um, you know, if we um, are able to, you know, look at our tax regime in terms of, I mean, if you go to the UK, for instance, the, NHI, the NHS is largely free for mm -hmm. citizens because 
once you get your salary, part of your salary is deducted as national health insurance, and everybody pays that uh, tax. You know, so uh, once that is done, and that goes, goes directly to any, it, it goes, doesn't go through yes, exactly. some goes, fund and then they cap it and it goes, all of that. It goes into the pool, mm. and then that helps to sustain mm. the because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. uh, if you uh, encumber the service too much and you are not also making sure that the inflows are expanded then you are going to have that problem so that is something that mm. uh, we should seriously look at as a country and the difference whatever and now that we've also done a national uh, id card system where mm -hmm. almost everybody can be clearly identified i think this is the time to be able to look at some of these issues because previously many people were not being identified clearly mm -hmm. and so if we can see that i mean people have been identified clearly then everybody should be able to make some payment into mm. this pool and then mm. for of course we can also make provision for those who are in so you agree place. with the suggestion about direct uh, deduction to keep the fund liquid uh, yes without encumbering it yes and so and so and then this is also also transcend so that it transcends uh, regimes you know it doesn't depend on the with government uh, with office. office it's something we, it's all something agree. That we all agree and okay. then as a nation once that is put in place i think mm. then it cuts across uh, different regimes and different generations so i think that mm. is very important and um, we also of course the idea about taxing certain luxury goods is also a good one and um, uh, but um, i think that we should we also call look them at, sin taxes yes but i think we should also look at uh, we have not looked at the angle of manufacturing because mm. uh, because we are a large import dependent what country. components of what do you need and can we do it here what do you need to do this yes yeah, so they, 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 they have the dialysis uh, 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 you know the, the consumer the things that fit into the machine the kits and then the diluents mm. you know the, the, these chemicals and it actually they can be produced in the country even for the peritoneal dialysis for instance it's possible to have them produced locally these are uh, things and will that, that be cheaper Yes, because once you are doing local production and uh, they are giving the right support, I think it can be done much better. Because um, you know, if you look at the cost of medical services, for instance, mm. in a place like India, uh, places, it is largely because a lot of the inputs are, are made there. Local. So that's why India is able to be competitive on price. Exactly. So they are able to compete. So in India, taking all those ways, there's a very large manufacturing.